Good morning. Today is Sunday, March 2nd, the last Sunday after the Epiphany. And here in Missouri, it's also the day of a pretty good snow and ice storm and frigid temperatures. And all of our NERM churches are closed today. So rather than being able to go to church, what I thought I would do is record the gospel and sermon for today so that at least if you were interested, you could have a chance to learn something from what we would have done had we been able to go to church today. The other readings, by the way, if you would like to look them up in the Bible, <clears throat> the first reading is from Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The psalm is psalm number 2. The epistle is from Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And the gospel is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Here on the last Sunday after the Epiphany, we're hearing the same words spoken by the voice of God that we heard on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. This is my Son, the Beloved, with him I am well pleased. We heard it the first time when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, and now we hear it again on the holy mountain of Jesus' transfiguration. There on the mountain, Jesus was revealed once again to be who he truly was and is, the Messiah and the Son of God. That's exactly, of course, what Peter had revealed to Jesus just a week before. When out in the desert in the region of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they had many answers. Moses, Elijah, one of the prophets. But it was Peter who said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus had praised Peter, saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It was immediately following that, however, that Peter received the greatest rebuke from Jesus he ever had. Jesus went on to explain that being Messiah meant that what he was to suffer and eventually to die. And Peter drew Jesus aside and said, This shall never happen to you. To which Jesus replied, Get behind me, Seder, Satan, for you are thinking not of divine things, but earthly things. So Jesus has been revealed. That's what Epiphany has been all about. Revealed truly to be the Messiah and the Son of God, but not the Messiah and the Son of God that perhaps everybody wanted or expected. Jesus is revealing who God truly is, and this also is a little upside down, because 
Jesus has been a very ordinary person who has taken particular interest in the poor, the downtrodden, the sick, those who are left out, not taking great interest in people of power and wealth and the like, especially not deferring to them. It's a particular problem we always have, is that in our world, much as in Jesus' world, to be rich and to be powerful is where it's at. But Jesus has taught us differently. At the end of that rebuke of Peter, Jesus said to all of his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? We're called, all of us are called, to follow Jesus and to follow his example of humility. St. Paul would, will talked about this in his letter to the Philippians. This is a reading that we will hear on Palm Sunday. Paul was doing the same thing, calling the church in Philippi to emulate Jesus by imitating that very humility and that love of service. Paul writes this, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The glory of God is revealed in that humble emptying. That is the nature of God, and it's to be the nature of God. God's, Jesus' followers, is to also empty themselves, to be servants, to become like God in every way, which is a God of love and care and compassion. This does not come naturally to us. Our natural desire is to be a big shot, to be important for people to pay attention to us, for people to think we are important. There's a wonderful story later in Matthew where the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, came to Jesus and asked a favor. And he said, what do you want? And she said, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I am to drink? And they said, we are able. Jesus went ahead to say, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant. When the ten, the other disciples, heard it, they said, they got angry. But Jesus said to them, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to, be, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. I found it interesting in the news this week is a story that the airlines have created a very special service for their most wealthy clients. These clients are able now to 
have their own private entrance to the airport, their own security. They get to board the plane apart from everyone else. And if they have to change planes somewhere else, they get met at the plane door and are taken down and driven in luxury cars. One of them is a Porsche, another one is a Mercedes, to their other plane. So you see, because a really wealthy person should not have to mix with the low life of the world. They're special because they're rich and they're wealthy and they're powerful and we should defer to them. That's what the world keeps saying. Except here on the mountain of the Transfiguration, we find that the very creator of the universe, the God who has called us into being, is not like that. A God who calls, who not just calls other people to serve, but who serves himself. A God who calls everyone to be loving and caring. It's not the way of the world, but it is the way of God. So as we begin to enter into Lent and this period of self-reflection, this is a time not just to think about how wonderful Easter will be, but a time to contemplate whether we can really take up the cross, whether we are really able and ready to be disciples of Jesus Christ, whether or not we can answer the call to serve everyone and not ourselves. I think we can, not because we're great, but because God is, and because God's grace has been poured into us and the Holy Spirit is here to empower us to do it, and most particularly because we have each other as well as God to share in this work, to encourage one another, as Christ has been revealed on the mountain to be a God of love and care and service, so also we can reveal that God in the world by doing the same thing. Amen. One last thing. In your prayers today, do remember everyone who has to be out in this cold and in the snow. Pray for the safety of everyone. And then also remember all those places in the world where there is much conflict and suffering, from Ukraine to Syria to Central Africa to Venezuela, all over the world. Please, please pray for everyone in need or in danger. God bless you. Goodbye.